Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. And, Lord, we just want to pause now and just come into your presence. And, Lord, we just want to say thank you for the privilege, the honor, Lord, truly, to be able to come before you. Lord, we just thank you so much that we can come to you clothed in your righteousness that you give to us. In the moment that we repented of our sin and truly gave our heart and life to you, and, Lord, ask you to be our Lord and Savior. And, Lord, we weren't trusting in anything but you. So, Lord, we just praise you for the salvation the eternal life, the quality of life, the quantity of life, Lord, that you give, Lord, it's absolutely amazing. Lord, and honestly, there, there's no human on this planet that could ever express true, true thankfulness for how grateful we truly need to be for you and for all that you do, all that you've done for us. Lord, we just pray now and just tell you that we are a needy people. Lord, we just pray that you'll fill us with your spirit today. Lord, we just pray that you'll help us to hear your word. Lord, we just pray that you'll just use it to just infuse life into us, strengthen us. Lord, bring conviction to our hearts. Lord, help it to be uh, a word that changes us into the image of your, your son all the more. Lord, conform us today into your image. Lord, help us to motivate us to be soul winners. Lord, help motivate us to do whatever it is that you would desire us to do, Lord. I pray that you reveal your will, Lord, to each and every one that's here. And Lord, we know that you don't hide your will. We just need to seek it, and Lord, that you'll give it. We just ask that you'll con continue to move mightily, Lord, here at our church. We pray for the leadership. We pray for wisdom. We just pray for your mercy and grace. We just pray that you'll continue to help us financially, Lord, just with uh, members, Lord, physically, spiritually. Lord, we just ask that you'll continue to put your mighty hand of blessing, Lord, upon us. I lift up every one of these petitions to you, Lord, as if they were my own. And Lord, I just ask with all my heart that you would move in all of these petitions according to your will. And Lord, we just ask that you would attend to each and every one of them. Lord, we just thank you that you are a God that does do that and that you're a God that numbers our head on our hairs, or our, our hairs on our head, Lord. There's, you number our steps. You put our tears in your bottle. A book of remembrance, Lord, is, re, is written before you. Every time we have a discussion about you, you tell us out of Malachi. So, Lord, we just praise you for how much you pay attention to us. And, Lord, we just pray that you'll forgive us when we don't pay as much attention to you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And, Lord, oh, also, if there's anyone in this room that's lost today, I pray that this would be the day that they would repent of their sin and that they would turn from their sin to you and put all their trust in your finished work on Calvary's cross that you accomplished for them and the fact that you were raised from the dead. And, Lord, you tell us in Romans 10, all those that truly call upon your name will be saved. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. First things first, guys. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And go over there to around, let's see here. This has nothing to do, well, it does have something to do with prophecy, but it has everything to do with what I've learned in the last day. And, uh, and I'm going to teach you what I learned. And so let me just start right off the bat. I owe everyone in this room an apology because there is a part of what I was saying was wrong. And what I was saying was wrong was out of my own ignorance of farm animals. All right? I'm sorry. I, I was very ignorant when it came to farm animals. But, hey, listen. It pays to know farm animals, especially when the Word of God talks about different animals. So it pays to know the difference between animals. Well, in my ignorance, and I admit that to you, that a part of what I was saying was wrong. So I'm going to correct myself today and make sure that you guys have it the way it's supposed to be. All right? All right. So I'm not trying to make it dramatic or anything like that. But however, my dear brother Al and George and I were all sitting in the back and we were about to go to outreach. And Brother Al said, hey, I noticed that you said on Sunday morning, and he said it very sweet, very kind, like you're supposed to. And now you've, always, you've heard me say, always challenge your preacher, right? Hey, man, I heard you say something. Hey, where's that? At? Man, praise God for people like that. Amen? I invite that. You need to invite that because it helps. It, well, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Amen? Amen. So anyway, so I said, he said, well, where does it say that the lion lies with the lamb? And I said, it says it in Isaiah. He said, well, show me where is that. So I went and I was reading. I said, it says right here, it says the lion will lie with the kid. Now, I thought a kid was a goat and a goat was a lamb and a lamb was a goat. Like a baby, a baby goat is a kid, right? Well, I thought a baby lamb, you could use kid and lamb interchangeably, but you can't. I didn't know that. Boy, so please understand you can't use lamb and kid and goat and these words synonymously because I really thought that you know a goat a lamb it's the same thing it's all part of the same family but 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 I was wrong and let me read the verse to you and let me explain all right look look at uh, verse number six it says the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb 
And the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of uh, an adder or a poisonous or a venomous snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand, and I, mean, I don't know what that word is, but basically on, on, a, on, on a snake's den or a viper's den. And then it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Now this is talking about the millennial reign during that period, okay? During this period right here on the chart, the millennial reign. And then it says, uh, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And in that day there shall be the root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To, to it shall be the Gentiles seek, and the rest shall be glorious. So, when you look at a kid, so I begin to study what's the difference between a lamb and a goat. Because you can't use them interchangeably. So that's my fault. I was wrong about that. I was ignorant. So here's the difference between a goat and a lamb. There's actually a biological difference. A lamb has 56 chromosomes, and a goat has 60 chromosomes. So there's a difference. Now, if a goat... Now, they're, 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 they're basically of the same kind, but they're like a subspecies of one another. So they're in the same kind. However, when you get a goat and, and breed it with a sheep, most of the offspring are stillborn. However, they can, have, they can have offspring that's perfectly normal. And when a goat and a sheep does have an offspring that comes out normal, they call it a jeep. Not J-E-E-P, but G-E-E-P, G for goat and E-E-P for sheep, right? So they call it a jeep. But they also call it a shoat, S-H-O-A-T, S-H for sheep and O-A-T for goat. So they call it a shoat, yes. A young pig is called a shoat as well? Well, there's something else I've learned. So you can call a young pig a shoat. However... The offspring of a goat and a sheep, they can also have offspring, but a lot of times they're, they're born or also stillborn as well. So there's a difference between goat and sheep. So you can't call, like, like for example, I thought a ram. I thought a ram was, was a goat or, or a lamb, you know, the same thing, but no, it's not. A ram is not a goat. A ram is part of the sheep family or the lamb family. And so there's two different scientific names for goat and sheep, by the way, and I'm not going to sit here and try to say what those are because I can't pronounce them, okay? But there's a difference, biological difference between the two. So it's kind of almost like, you know, when you begin to study, so God begin to open my eyes by understanding this about these differences between animals. So when you go to Matthew 24 and 25 where he talks about separating the sheep from the goat, the nations, you remember that? And there's a difference between the sheep and the goat. So a goat person represents those that are lost, the Bible says, right? If you look at what a jeep is or the offspring like a hybrid, that would be like a Christian that professes to know Christ but really does not possess Christ because they can't officially call themselves a lamb. So only sheep are the ones that hear God's voice. Only sheep are the ones that follow their shepherd. Goats don't do that, but sheep do. There's a difference, as our dear sister right here pointed out. So I got an education. So when I used to say well the, you know the lion's gonna lie with the lamb and I really sincerely believe that but I was sincerely ignorant in that so here's what the scripture teaches the wolf is gonna lie with the lamb and the lion is gonna lie with the kid a goat that's what that scripture teaches are you with me now a lot of people a lot of people if they're if they're honest they'll say you know what man I, I've always thought it was the lion and the lamb and there in Isaiah chapter 11 I've always heard that the lion and the lamb are gonna lie to lie down together in the millennial reign. But why? Because you hear the lion out of the tribe of Judah. Then you hear what? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, right? So we, we begin to associate that. And that's what I probably, that's probably what I did too. But, but honestly, I really thought a kid was called a lamb or a goat. You could use those interchangeably and you can't. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so when the ram got caught in the thicket, see, like, like what she said was, for all these years, I thought that the ram was a goat. 
that was caught in the thicket because it's got horns, you know, like a goat. So I thought the same thing, but no. It's so, so a ram, though, is a lamb. Isn't that cool? Boy, a ram is considered in the lamb family. Wow, so that's why it was a ram and not a goat that was caught in the thicket. So there's a difference. So I've learned. So, so anyway, so I hope and pray that you'll forgive me and that you'll take this information and use it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you, a you. It's called a you. Yeah, a you lamb. They could call me you lamb, but a you is a female. Yes, yes, indeed. So, anyway, I don't know if you if you believe that yourself about the lion and the lamb. Well, I wanted to clear that up because that's not what God's word teaches. God's word teaches that it's the wolf and the lamb, and the lion and the kid. Big difference. Amen. So, thank you for the question, my dear brother Al. Yes, indeed. And that's exactly. What every church needs to do. Man, if you hear something that your pastor's teaching, and maybe maybe he's off because he's ignorant about farm animals, man. Man, please challenge me so that I also can be the student that God wants me to be of the truth, to rightly to be able to divide it. Amen? Amen. Okay. Her question is, she was taught that she thought that Satan had eyes of fire and that Jesus had different different type of eyes. All right, so let's go. Where do we go to find the truth? Revelation. The Word of God, right? And where are we going to go? Revelation chapter 1, right? All right, let's go. Let's see here. Revelation, if my memory serves me well, that's a great question. Because I had mentioned in my sermon that if somebody tells you that Jesus has blue eyes, that you're know, not to believe them. Because the Word of God doesn't teach what color his eyes were in any part of the Scripture, Old and New Testament. We have no clue what color Jesus' eyes were. However, in Revelation, he tells us what his eyes look like today, how he is today. Because you've got to remember in the Gospels, the, the deity of Jesus Christ was what? It was veiled in humanity, right? But in Revelation... We see the revelation, the apocalypse. We see the full revelation of Jesus Christ and how he is. So now it's reversed. See, in the Gospels, his deity was veiled by his humanity. But now in Revelation, his humanity is wrapped around his deity, if you will. So his, de his deity is on display now, right? And his humanity. So you're seeing both. You're seeing Jesus as he really is in heaven. So let's read. Let's see here. Um... What's that? Verse 14. All right, it says, His head and his hairs were like wool. Not saying they were wool, but it's, it's so John is seeing this revelation of Jesus. Could you imagine trying to describe Jesus, even yourself, to people that you know? Seeing, like having a vision of what Jesus, I mean, trying to explain that. So he's just comparing it to things that he knows. So he's saying his hair was like white, like wool, right? And then he says this. As white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Do you see that? His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, referring to his word. So the word of God teaches us that his eyes are like a flame of fire, but we don't know what that color is we don't know if it's red orange we don't know but it's like a flame of fire but now satan when it gives a description of him it gives a description of him in ezekiel chapter 28 and it says that satan was made or created uh full of wisdom and perfect in beauty the bible says think about that satan was created perfect in beauty and what does the bible say that he, why did he fall what does the bible say he got he got the doing in heaven pride but what but where did his pride come from it says very specifically that he was doing an activity in heaven that got him in trouble no anybody well he was doing that in isaiah right but but before that he well he he got this thought in his head and where did he get the thought in his head to want to be god you remember what it says Right, he wanted his throne higher than God's throne, but before all that, that 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 seed had to grow. 
right? And it says that he, he was corrupted by the brightness of his beauty. So in other words, he got to staring at himself in some mirror in heaven and, and, and fell in love with himself and said, I want all the angels to worship me. It says he was corrupted by the brightness of his beauty. Now notice the Bible says that he was made perfect in beauty, full of wisdom. But that wisdom is now corrupt, and he uses it to be what? Man, deceptive and deceitful. Yes, sir. I, 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 well, he asked the question, is that why Jesus, when he came, was this an ordinary man of not beauty or anything like that? Right. Yes. What's that? Oh, he's the ultimate narcissist, Satan. Boy, you talk about narcissists. Man, he's the ultimate. Yes. Ezekiel 28. Yeah, it says when it says in it says in Ezekiel 28. There's two 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 stories in Ezekiel 28, and it's talking about King Tyre. And King Tyre was an evil king who trafficked and peddled all of his junk, got rich by doing all this corrupt junk. Well, then what happens is God pulls back the curtain halfway in Ezekiel 28 and says, let's look at the culprit behind King Tyre. Let's look at the one that's that's tempting him and and trying to be his puppet. Well, it shows that Satan also was trafficking and peddling in heaven, uh, and that's how he got a third of the angels to follow him. So it gives the story of just what this king, because that king said that he wanted to be God. Well, it goes back, and it shows that Satan also wants to be God. But in that, in that, in that story, it talks about, and then at the judgment, people are going to look at Satan and say, is this the one? Is this the one right here that destroyed, was a destroyer of nations? And they're going to narrowly look upon him as if he's like this insignificant little thing in the eyes of God. And Satan is an insignificant little thing. And I would say everything is insignificant and little in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Boy. Yes, indeed. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, Armageddon. Yes. Yes. Armageddon. All right, I'll try to I'll try to send you a couple links on that. But Psalm Psalm eighty three is where the, basically it doesn't say ring of fire in Psalm eighty three, but scholars are divided on Psalm eighty three. Psalm eighty three was written by Asaph, which was the musical leader of of Israel and he also wrote songs but it also says in Chronicles that Asaph was a seer he was a prophet of God and when you read Psalm 83 it lists 10 different countries in there let me see if I can find uh... it lists 10 different countries that surround Israel and a lot of people think some scholars think that that Psalm 83 if it is a prophecy was fulfilled uh, in the six day war but when you look at the six day war it doesn't it doesn't add up it, the puzzles does not you got to really force things to fit and you just can't do that uh, some people think it was fulfilled in parts of Isaiah but when you look at that all the countries were not represented so you got to have 10 countries because God says there's going to be 10 10 people groups that hate Israel well when you look at and study this one of these people groups didn't even exist in the Old Testament until later on so that's why a lot of scholars lend and believe that this might be a prophecy and that prophecy would be that this ring of fire this ring of fire those nations that surround Israel that Iran is fueling and funding and supporting and and uh, keeping it alive if you will and um, let's see here Israel's ring of fire well it's not a good picture but um, you got Iran, Iraq, you got, and then you got Syria. And the, the, the big thing right now is you got Russia, Iran, and Iraq, and all these different troops in Syria. And anytime, anytime one of these people attack Israel, well, then, of course, Israel tries to do the right thing, tries to make do peaceful, but they gotta, they got to basically get on the phone with Russia and say, hey, can we fly over Syria? 
so that we can take care of business, so that we can take care of the people that, you know, that attacked us, so that we can defend ourselves. And if Russia says, no, you can't fly over Syria, boy, that's going to be a major war right there because Russia would be basically telling Israel, no, you can't defend yourself anymore. And Israel's not going to put up with that for two seconds. Amen? So, that, so in other words, there could be a lot of triggers over there that, that can cause that war to happen, if you will. But anyway, Psalm 83, what they believe is going to happen, those that believe that Psalm 83 is a prophecy, they believe that when Israel attacks or when Israel defeats all these proxies that surround, that Israel is going to gain more territory. And when Israel, Israel gains more territory, what's that going to do to the rest of the world? Make it matter, right? It's going to be even more upset because Ezekiel's already told us that the world, Russia, Iran, North Africa, some of these other people, want what Israel has. They want Israel's possessions. And you remember that Israel just discovered all that oil. Man, 100, I think it was 160, 160, I, think, I said 150, but I think it was actually 160 uh, uh, billion, right? Barrels, uh, gallon, or barrels of, of, of oil. And so the world's gonna want that. So they basically say that when that happens, some people think that, man, uh, Isaiah chapter 17 is a prophecy that Damascus is going to be wiped off the map. Some people think that's going to be during the tribulation because there's a verse that says that men are going to stand and their eyes are going to melt in their socket, their tongue is going to melt in their mouth while they're standing on their feet and their eyes are going to melt. What does that sound like? That sounds like a nuclear bomb to us, right? Now, can we say, thus says the Lord, it is a nuclear bomb? No, we can't. But we can use our sanctified imagination and say, well, it certainly sounds like one. Amen? Boy, it does. So some people think that if Israel were to do that, because in Damascus, right here, Damascus, where Syria and all these people are, that Russia and all them are going to keep messing around, messing around. Well, then some people think that Israel may nuke them. And, and that prophecy would come true that Damascus was wiped off the map because that's what that prophecy teaches in Isaiah 17 well if that happens well then the world would be like whoa hey man Israel's not playing games we, we need peace we need peace somebody's got to show up on the scene and, and, and work all this out and make a peace treaty with Israel so that's one theory right the other theory is is that all this is going to take place they're going to receive land and then that's going to that's going to cause the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war to go into effect and cause the other nine countries that don't border Israel to come and attack Israel. So that's the other theory, and that during the tribulation is when Damascus is going to be wiped off the map. So there's two different, two different thoughts on that. I want you to have both of those. Yes, sir. Yes. No. The difference between... The difference between well, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, guys. The difference between Armageddon and the Battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39. The Battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 has nine countries, right? Those nine countries are what? Who can tell me? We've gone over this several times. What are the nine countries? Russia, Russia. Russia Iran. Parts of North Africa, right? Turkey, parts of, uh, of Afghanistan, Pakistan, all those places right up here, right? Russia, this part, you got Turkey, you got parts of uh, North Africa, you got Iran, all coming against Israel. All right, so these are nine countries that are coming against Israel for the battle that's called Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. The difference between this battle... And Armageddon is what? What's the difference between this battle that has nine countries and the battle of Armageddon has how many countries against Israel? All the whole world is against Israel. Remember that? So that's the difference. That's how we know that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not the battle of Armageddon because it's dealing with nine countries. Very specifically written there in Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 1 through 6. You can read those countries right there. Armageddon, though, it says that God's going to cause Israel to be a, a stone around the, the neck of the world, a weight to the world, and all nations are going to hate Israel. And then it says in Revelation chapter 20, 
uh, or 19, I believe, that God's going to send out three demons, and these three demons are going to go and gather all the nations of the world to do battle at the Battle of Armageddon. So Armageddon's going to be every nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is only going to be nine nations. Yes. Okay, so the 200 million man march that comes from the east that Revelation talks about, right? That's going to be during the Battle of Armageddon. That's going to be during the Battle of Armageddon. Why? Because that's coming from Asia. You'll notice that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that when you look at what the Bible says, It only mentions these certain countries, right, for Ezekiel 38 and 39. But for the Battle of Armageddon, though, man, it's the whole entire world. Now, what was your question again? Yeah, the 200 million man march, right? So, did you notice that Asia, or, or, or Asia Minor's in here, because, you know, Israel's part of Asia, don't get me wrong. But, but Asia, the Far East, Asia, is not mentioned. China, India, and all those countries are not mentioned at all. But it does say that there's going to be a 200 million man march coming from the east. That is going to be during the Battle of Armageddon. And that's when the Bible says that the Euphrates River is going to dry up. And that there's going to be a 200 million man march coming from, from Asia somewhere. Now, we presume China, but it may not be. Because right now, in India, there's more people in India than there's China. So it, you, you just, but it's coming from Asia. Now, that's, not, that, that's, that's, that's the number that God says is coming from Asia. But that's not all the numbers coming from everywhere else. Well, I'm telling you what, it's going to be, it's going to be, you talk about an epic one-time event like you've never seen on this planet ever, nor will you ever see again. Man, it's going to be that time of tribulation with all those people that are coming. And no wonder, no wonder why the blood can flow five feet high, 200 miles down a river. Boy, because of that many people coming to the battle of Armageddon. So do you see there's a difference between Gog and Magog, this is a conventional war with nine countries that are against Israel. And God, we talked about that on Sunday, how God's going to just do all the fighting for them. He's going to send rain, earthquakes, swords going to be turned. They're going to turn on one another. How God's going to bring confusion, I don't know, but he's going to do it. And the Bible says there's going to be hell, uh, fire and brimstone. And I just learned recently that there's two volcanoes in Israel. I didn't know that. Boy, isn't that interesting? In the mountains of Israel, two big volcanoes, fire and brimstone. Now, God, if he wants, he can send meteors from heaven and fall on earth if he wants to do that, too. He can do however he wants to do it. Amen? But we do know that he's going to wipe out that whole entire army. So, that's called Gog and Magog. But then there's also another battle in Revelation chapter 20 called Gog and Magog. And that battle doesn't take place until after the millennial reign. So here's what's going on, guys. Let's just get a recap. Right now, I personally believe, step out of the pulpit, this is my personal sanctified opinion, okay? My opinion. I believe, well, man, guys, we're right here. Boy, we're right here, man. That, that, that Jewish guy talking about the temple, well, that just got me so excited, man. We're getting close, guys. We really are. So a lot of scholars believe that this Ezekiel war can take place in the, either the year 2024 or 2025, and it would leave enough room based on how they are looking at it, right? So that's kind of where I'm at. I think that a lot of this might take place right in here. Now, I could be wrong. Study it yourself, too, but I think it might take place here. So you have Ezekiel, uh, you have Psalm 83, if that, if that prophecy does come true, and, and Israel gains territory, that might trigger the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. But I think all of it's going to take place right here. Some people think it's going to take place, and it's going to go uh, halfway into the tribulation period. Some people think that as well. So you, you need to study that yourself, okay? But I, I'm, I'm of the persuasion it's back here, okay? This is where I'm at with it. So then you have uh, that going on. You, you, you have... Uh, those wars going on. The rapture takes place. Then what, ha what takes place after the rapture? The next big war is going to be the battle of what? So, so in my opinion, Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83 is going to take place. The rapture is taking place, right? Then at the end of the tribulation, what war is that going to be? The battle of Armageddon, right? And then we go into the millennial kingdom. And then at the end of the thousand years, what happens? Who can tell me? All right, but what happens? How does that war start? 
Satan's let out of the pit because he's been in the pit with his henchmen for a thousand years, right? That's how you have peace on earth for a thousand years, by putting that pit bull away for a while, amen? So when he's released, he gathers all the fakes and phonies, and then the Bible says, like, like the sea, the sand of the end, they're going to come up upon the whole face of the earth against Jerusalem, the Bible says in Revelation uh, 20. And fire comes down out of heaven, devours them all. That battle is also called the battle of Gog and Magog. But that's, that happens after the millennial reign. So you've got all these wars still coming. You've got, perhaps if it's true, the Psalm 83 war. You've got Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Then you've got the great tribulation war. And then you have Gog and Magog, the war that takes place after the thousand years is over. Yes. Oh, yeah. As far as, like, biblically, if, if, if Psalm 83 is indeed a prophecy, you have that war. You have Ezekiel 38, 39, which we know for sure is going to take place, absolutely. And then after that, you have the Battle of Armageddon. And then after Armageddon, you have a thousand years of peace. And then you have that last war called Gog and Magog, where everyone comes against Jerusalem that basically gave lip service to Jesus for those thousand years while they were on earth. Boy. And then we go into what's known as what we preached on Sunday, the great white throne judgment. So are you, are you guys starting to get the picture? You, you guys starting to get a little bit of handles? Because I, 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 I don't want to be redundant, but I know that sometimes you have to be because it's a big puzzle, big pieces, big, big things that you got to put in place. But I want you guys, at least in your mind, to have a simple formula. Hey, the next big event is going to be the rapture. And the next big event after that is going to be the beam of seat of Christ. And the next big event after that is going to be Armageddon. And we're going to come back with him on white horses. We're going to see that battle. And then we're going to go into the millennial reign, right? And then we're going to see that war. And fire come down, devour all those people. Then we're going to be taken off the planet. This planet will sit as quiet as an Egyptian tomb. There will be nobody else on earth. That's the great white throne judgment after that. And then after that, we go into what's known as the eternal day. Now, that's a big, these are big, big pieces no details, but these are big pieces that I want you to at least have in your mind that you can put your hands on and say, hey, I know what's coming next. So let me give you a test. Real quick, all right? Study this map. Study it before I hook it up. All right, let's look here. Let's see here. All right. All right. So what's coming next? The rapture's coming next, all right? What's coming after the rapture? The what? The beam of seat, right? Yes. So it's not on this chart, but the Bible says that my reward is with me when I come. My reward is with me when I come. I'll give to every man according to his works. Over and over, Jesus says that. So we know that the beam of seat for Christians, the judgment for Christians, takes place right after the rapture. Boom, all right? What takes place next? The marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where me and Sister Betty have been talking. Because there's two schools of thought on the marriage supper of the Lamb. Some people think it's going to take place in heaven, and some people think it's going to take place during the millennial reign. When everybody's together, the Old Testament saints are raised. That's when they're raised up is at the beginning of the millennial reign. So I, I'm, I'm of the persuasion that it might be during the millennial reign, but other people are of the persuasion that it might be in heaven. And both could be correct, guys. Both could be correct. Good tools, two, two good schools of thought, two great discussions to have. So we got the rapture. We got the bema seat. We got the marriage supper of the Lamb. What happens next? What? How many people think tribulation, raise your hand, that happens next? Ra ra raise your hand if you think tribulation happens next after the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes, yes, raise your hand, yes, yes, yes. How do I know? Whoops. All right, so we got the rapture, we got the bema seat. Marriage Supper of the Lamb can take place between these seven years, right? Or it can take place on earth. So there's a debate about that, all right? But for right now, we'll just say it's going to take place in heaven, right? So it's going to take place during these, these seven years, all right? Now, after the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, what happens? The what? Nope, but that's close. 
We're during, we're during, so what, so what, when we're in heaven, what's going on on earth? And how long does that last? And what is a Jewish prophetic year based on? 365 days or 360? 360, right? Right, okay, you guys are getting it. All right, so after the marriage supper of the Lamb, we do what? What does the church do? What comes next? So the supper's over, and the tribulation's about to end. Jesus is going to do what? We come back with him. Absolutely. And how do we know that we come back with him? Man, Revelation 19, the book of Jude, the man Enoch predicted even before he got raptured and translated back in the Genesis. Remember how he got translated? And God took him and he was no more, the Bible says. He's the one that God used his book, the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch is not in the canon. It's not in our Bible because there's a lot of stuff in it that's just kind of doesn't jive and contradicts itself. However, God did take a quote out of that book and he stuck it in the book of Jude because it says Enoch out of the book of Enoch it says that he, he, he quoted that the Lord would come back with tens and thousands of his saints the word of God also says in the Old Testament concerning the second coming of Christ that all of his saints are coming back with him and we are because the dead in Christ shall rise first those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air and so shall we meet them and meet the Lord and we'll be so shall we ever be with the Lord amen yes indeed so, the next great event is the tribulation, and then at the end of the tribulation, we do what? We come back? Okay, then when he comes back, what's Jesus going to do to the Antichrist and the false prophet? Casts them into the lake of fire, right? And what does he do with Satan? Right, all right, okay. Well, I won't even show you the screen. Okay, so once Satan's bound up for a thousand years, then what happens? All right, how many people think the millennial kingdom is going to happen next? Raise your hand. After Satan's bound, after the Antichrist and the false beasts are thrown into the lake of fire, how many people think the millennial reign is going to start next? Raise your hand. No, a thousand years is the millennial reign. Millennial means a thousand. So how many people think that the millennial reign is going to start right after the tribulation is over? All right, raise your hand. There you go. That's the right answer. Amen. So... Rapture, beam and seat of Christ, where Christians are judged for the things they've done in their body, their service to the Lord, right? Marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Tribulations going on. We come back with Jesus and his holy angels to the battle of Armageddon. Satan's bound. His Satan and cast into the pit. The beast and the false prophet are cast into hell or, or to the lake of fire. Then we go to what's known as the millennial reign for a thousand years. Right? And at the end of that thousand years, we just discuss what's going to happen. What's going to happen at the end of the thousand years? What's that? Satan's loose. And what does Satan do? He gathers all the nations together, deceives them, has them march against Jerusalem. Fire comes down out of heaven, devours all them. And then we go into what's known as the great white throne. We talked about that on Sunday. And then we go into what's known as the eternal day. Are you with me? Yes. No, that would be post-trib. Post-trib. Po post-trib would believe that. Here, let me, let me go to a post-trib real quick. Let's see if I got post-trib on here. All right, post-trib. Post-trib believes that the church is going to go through the tribulation period with Israel, experience all the judgments, all the judgments that are going to happen, all those things. And then, and then if you make it through all of that, when Jesus comes back from heaven, right, the dead in Christ will, be, will go first. So they're, they're going to get up there first. They'll get their white horses and all theirs first, right? And then, the, then, then those of us that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them, right, to meet the Lord in the air. So if you're a post-tribber, you believe you're going to go through all through the tribulation, and if you survive all of that, that Jesus is going to come halfway, he's going to call everybody up, and then immediately turn right around and come right back to earth, just like that quick. That's not what the Scripture teaches at all. Yeah, the yo-yo effect. Yeah, like we're going to go up and then do a, a quick U-turn, an immediate U-turn. And that's not what Scripture teaches. 
because it doesn't leave room for the what? The bema seat, right? You got to leave room for all that stuff, right? When does that happen? That happens right after the right after the rapture takes place. The bema seat, right? So post trib uh, gets it wrong. And by the way, post trib and mid trib people that think the rapture is going to take place when the antichrist goes into the temple. That's mid trib. Post trib is we're going to go through the tribulation. Jesus is going to come back. The church is going to be called up and do an immediate U turn and come right back. Both of those views focus on the Antichrist. The only view that focuses on Jesus Christ is the pre-tribulation view. Why would, why, would, why would Paul say in Titus, looking for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ? Why would he say it's a blessed hope? Why would he say that? Why would he tell the church of Ephesus, hey, Man, there's going to be a testing that's going to come upon the whole world. Pray that you may escape. Why does he tell the people in Luke chapter 21, hey, pray that you may escape these things that are coming. Why? Because there is an escape, and it's called the rapture. Yes. Correct. Yes. So, so think about that. Your loved ones that have gone to heaven right now, like my mom's in heaven, maybe you have loved ones that knew the Lord that are in heaven. Now, they don't know, but, I, 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 but I'm sure that when the rapture does take place, there's going to be some type of commotion going on in heaven. Hey, man, they're getting ready for something, man. Man, why, 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 is, that, why, why is that guy about to blow that trumpet over there? Boy, you know. And could you just imagine when that day? Now, think about people in heaven. They're obviously more privy than we are. They obviously know more things about, about what's going on than we do, right? I would say that my mom knows a whole lot more about heaven than I do because I'm not there. I haven't been there, right? So I'm sure those that are in heaven, I'm sure they're anticipating just like we are the day that Jesus is coming back. Because you remember when all those people got martyred in, in Revelation, they, they lost their head because they didn't receive the mark on their right hand or their forehead. Remember what they said to Jesus when they were standing before the throne? What did they say? Tell me what they said. How long, oh Lord, are you going to not avenge us for what they've done to us? Remember that? So they remembered. They have anticipation. So I just can imagine that your loved ones also have anticipation of the great reunion. For them, it's, for us, it's the rapture. But really, for them, it's the great reunion, man, to reunite. It's a reunion for us to reunite with our loved ones. Yes. Okay. See, I, she, her question is, are our loved ones looking down at us, and do they know what's going on? And the answer to that question is, I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say. I, I, my imagination, not does say the Lord, far removed from the pulpit, I, I would say, you know, I, if they did know what was going on, Or, 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 if they didn't know what was going on, they, 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 they would know in, in their new mind, their new perspective, being not in a sinful state, they would know that God's going to take care of us. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't know, but, but that's, that's going to be determined. But I do know that there will be anticipation for us wanting to see them because I, I can't wait to see my mom. And I just can't help but think that there's anticipation on their part. And so when they're coming down, we're, we're going up. Now what's taking place is it happens so fast. It happens so fast. The Bible says that that change is in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I've taught you this, so let's see if you, how good you remember this. What does it mean when the Bible says the twinkling of an eye? What's that? It's the anticipation of an eye blink, or it's called the jerk of the eye, right? Well, when you talk to an eye doctor, they have to use a slow motion camera, those cameras that take like 5,000 frames a second, whatever, they show an eye, and what happens is there's a, you can't see it with the naked eye. You've got to have a camera to see it, but there's like a slight little jerk, just a little jerk of the muscle, just like that, and then your eye blinks right after that jerk. God is talking about that jerk. So what's going to happen is people that are in heaven coming back with Jesus, their bodies are going to come up out of the grave, and they're going to meet, if you will, their body, their new body in the air. It's going to happen so fast you won't even see it. Their body's going to be pulled out of the grave, and instantly they're going to have their new body. And when we are raptured, we're instantly going to have the same body that Jesus has because it says we'll be just like him, right? And then we're going to have that reunion in the air. Then we're going to go into the Bema seat where we're going to be judged for the things that we've done in our body. Did you have a question? 
Okay. That's right. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? He said, since, since, since we all blink, we can all be categorized as jerks, right? That's funny. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Cremation? Boy, cremation. That's a good question. Is it wrong to be cremated? All right, some people say no. Other people say yes, it is wrong to be cremated. Right. Hitler didn't want to be cremated. You know why? This is a rumor. Can't, I wasn't there. I didn't hear him say it. But, but it said one of the reasons why he wanted to be cremated was so that God couldn't get to him, get to his body. Well, listen, you can, take, you can take somebody's ashes, and you can, take some and put, you can put some ashes in seven oceans, and God's going to get all those ashes and collect them back together because he knows where every molecule is. How do we know that he knows where every molecule is? What scripture would you take me to to prove that God knows where every molecule is? Hairs on your head, but there's, there's one better than that. Where would you take me to prove that God holds every atom in his hand? Where, what, what scripture would you take me to to prove that? That he's absolutely in control of everything. What scripture would you take me to? Anybody? All right. Hebrews chapter 1. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Real quick, guys. Hebrews chapter 1. You get the James, take a left. All right, chapter 1. All right, it says, uh, God who at sundry times in verse 1 in diverse manners spake in past times unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us in son. Your version might say by his son, but it literally he spoke to us in son. Why? Because Christ is God. He's the... Everything God the Father is invisibly, Christ is visibly, right? So that's what it means, in Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholds what? All things by what? When he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of majesty and high. So we know for a fact that he's talking about Jesus being God and that Jesus You have your being, you move, you exist, everything. The Bible says that his soul is in the very palm of his hand, according to Daniel. That every soul, every living soul is in his hand. Boy, so God is absolutely sovereign over all things. So that's important to know. All right, so that's how you know to answer that question. Any other questions? Any other questions at all? You guys learning? Okay, good. Well, that's what matters. You guys are learning. You're getting it. God's putting a spring in your step. Amen. Well, that's why it's so important, man, to study prophecy. Because, man, look what it does, man. It motivates you, man. It just energizes you. Doesn't it not? I know it does me. Boy, it does. Man. And the benefits of, man, studying it. Man, it should motivate you, man, to be that soul winner. Amen. All right, so here's a question. Now, I know he knows, and I know he knows that you guys can't answer, okay? Because we discussed it yesterday, all right? So here's the question. What prophecy is most neglected when it talks about Jesus coming back? There's one major thing that absolutely has to happen, has to happen, in order for Jesus to come back. Now, there's several things that have to happen, don't get me wrong, but there's one of those things that has to happen that gets neglected the most. What prophecy is that? The last person has to be saved. All right, that's a good one. But that's not, that's not it. Go in your Bible to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Now, this is one prophecy that has to take place, guys, that has to take place in order for Jesus to come back that's rarely, rarely mentioned. At least I haven't heard people mention it. 
Notice what it says in verse 14. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. What does it say, church? And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what? Yes, indeed. Do you see that? So what does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach there? What has to happen for Jesus to come back? Yes, indeed. All nations will hear the gospel, right? Go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. What's that? Yeah, so God's word teaches that every nation, every nation has to hear the gospel and for Jesus to come back. That's what it says, right? Did you read it? You read what it said? What did it say? All nations, he has to, so every nation has to hear the gospel right now. Guess what? Right now they say there's about 2 billion people that have never heard the name of Jesus. And people say, well, man, that's hard to believe, Brother Dave. Boy, really? Listen, I've talked to two kids in this country. Right, how are they going to hear, right? Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. That's the answer. That's how the whole world's going to know. You see, when I was young, well, that's dumb. That's, well, when I was younger, right? When I was younger, right? I used to teach, hey, there's only one plan, and that's plan A, and you're plan A, and there's no one else in this world that's going to tell somebody about Jesus. Well, I was wrong. I was wrong when I, when I used to teach that. So how is the whole world going to hear the gospel when there's 2 billion people right now that are unreached, right? Boy, now, you would think in this country that that would not be a true statistic. But I've actually talked to two kids myself, and I said, Do you, have you ever heard of Adam and Eve? No. Never heard of Adam and Eve. Have you ever heard of Noah? Noah's Ark and the animals. No, I never heard of that either. This is right here in America with me talking to them. Boy. Do you realize that there's, there, there's nations right now that are sending missionaries to our country to evangelize us? Boy. Boy. What does that tell you? Now, where did I say go? Roman. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think I'm right. Am I right? My memory helps me here. Let me see. What does it say? Revelation 14, 6. It says, and, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to how many nations? And how many kindreds? And every kindred and every tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, etc. So you see right there, God is going to send an angel to preach to the rest of the world so that the whole world will hear the gospel. And then is when Jesus will come. So that's one prophecy that's neglected that you don't hear a lot about is the whole world has to hear the gospel too. Amen? So we've got to put that one on the list. Amen? Anybody else have any questions? Guys, listen, I've got ten signs of the times that I've had for three weeks now that we haven't even touched. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm glad that you guys are learning. It's, it's okay. But I, I want to get into those as well. Yes. How is that going to work? How's that going to work? Well, I mean, are we still going to be here when the angel does that? No, that'll be during the tribulation period. Oh, okay. Yeah, Revelation 14 is right dead smack in the middle of the tribulation. So it's going to be, it's going to be those saints. Yes, indeed. You see, a lot of people think, oh, you know, you, you, you pre-tribbers, you, you guys that think you're going to get raptured before the tribulation happens, I mean, what makes you think that you deserve not to go through the tribulation? Boy, my, my answer to that question is, listen, brother, I deserve to go through the tribulation times infinity. Amen? I deserve to go to hell times infinity. Boy, so let's not talk about who deserves it. We all deserve to go to hell according to the word of God. Right? Now, think about this. What does, what does the Lord call his church? His bride, right? Now, how many of you, on the way to your wedding, made sure that your bride had the most difficult, hard time of her life before her wedding day? I mean, let, let, let's just make sure she gets dirty. Let's, let's, get, let's get her beat up really good. Let's, let's, let's get that dress all dirty, and then let's present her. 
right? Is that how we do it? Now, guys, I know I'm talking out of the pulpit, but, but, but you think about that. We're, we're the bride of Christ, right? And if you look at the pattern, God warns, then judges. God warns, then judges. He warned the world about the flood. He used Noah to do it. He warned, and then he what? Judge. And he warned a lot. Hey, man, get your family out of here. He warned, and then he what? Judge. And that's how God does it. I personally think Ezekiel 38, 39, when he slaughters all those, all those people on the mountains of Israel, and when the whole world's watching Israel bury uh, the dead for seven months, boy, and as it says, I'm going to get the world's attention, Israel from that day forward is going to believe in me. I believe that is the last huge warning to this planet that the rapture's on the way and that you better repent and get right with God. Amen. You know, one thing I, I failed to say, if you don't mind, let me just say this and we'll close. You remember on Sunday I was preaching on the dash, that little dash? And my whole point of preaching on the dash was to, to try to convey how long and how weighty eternity really is. And you remember how I showed that picture of the sun being just one pixel on the screen compared to that one big sun? Remember that? It dawned on me that if you take that big sun and you take our sun that's this one pixel on the screen, if you take the whole universe and how big it is, right? Just, 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 just think about how big the one star is compared to our sun. It makes it one pixel. So think about how small we are just with that. Then you think about the whole universe and how big it is in the backdrop of our planet, right? Then you take our universe, our universe, and this is what I forgot to say. If you take our universe and the enormity of it, it too also turns into a little teeny tiny dash in the backdrop of eternity. Boy, boy. Every second that ticks by in hell, I'm telling you, is going to feel like an eternity. And I'm not, listen, I know people think it's cute, but it's true. It's relative. When you're a young man with a pretty girl for an hour, it's going to feel like a second. But if you, that same young man sits on a stove for a minute that's got fire, it's going to feel like an eternity. Amen? Now, one minute is going to feel like an eternity, but I'm telling you, every second, if you were to bottle up, ah, if you were to bottle up all the pain, any, any type of emotional pain, physical pain, uh, mental pain, any, any just horrific pain, all the pain that anybody from Adam, from the stub of the toe, to the most wicked thing that could ever be done to somebody. If you were to take all that pain and put it into a bottle, do you realize that that bottle, as horrible as that bottle would be, all the death, all the tragedy, all, all this, the heartaches, all the nightmares that are in that bottle, do you realize that that bottle will turn into a little teeny tiny dash compared to the pain and the tidal wave that's coming that hell's going to bring? Boy, boy, praise God for Jesus. Praise God for salvation. Praise God for his word that puts a spring in our step and gives us hope. Amen? Boy. Boy, oh boy. I'm going to ask our dear brother Brad if he'll close us in prayer.